Hello, everyone, and welcome to another iteration of Science of Cinema. Um, we've got another very special guest joining us today from the world of Doctor Who, but we will get to that in just a moment. Um, Science of Cinema, as you should all know by now, is um, if you're a regular watcher of these interviews, then you'll know it's a series of online videos that we're doing with various people from across the film and TV industry talking about their careers and how they got started and stuff like that and any advice that they may have for people that want to follow in that path. Um, all of which, as always, is in aid of the wonderful Medi Cinema, who uh, are a British charity who build cinemas in hospitals and places of care up and down the country. Um, so you can go check their website out. It'll be somewhere around here. I don't know where they put the links these days. Um, but go and check out their website. They've just updated um, or uploaded a brand new um, video on their website with um, Simon Pegg, who's one of the... Um, um, pro um, oh, I forget the word. Um, not promote patrons. Thank you, patrons. There we go. Um, so go and check that out. And if you can, please make a generous donation. Um, it's an amazing charity. So let me dive straight in with this one because um, I'm very, very excited about this. Um, my guest today, as um, as always with most of my guests, they are very well known for being in the world of Doctor Who, but they have also done many, many other things. Um, very brief intro because I, I really want to get into the the grit of asking these questions now. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my guest, Katie Manning. Hello, Katie, how are we? Hello, darling, how are you? Yeah, I just heard the mention Simon Pegg and I, when I did my chat show in Australia, I actually interviewed Simon Pegg um, and, uh, oh, he's just a wonderful, very talented, young man. And it was just after the movie, um, oh, what's it called? I've gone completely Blank. Um, the one with the little, 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 little oh, the, 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 oh, terrible. It's a great way to start an interview, isn't it? I go to tell you something and then I can't remember the, the name of the film that was so brilliant. One of the few films that I actually saw three times. Oh, was it Mission Impossible? Uh, on. No. 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 I wouldn't watch that three times, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was um, Shaun of the Dead. Ah, yes, yeah. Which I thought was wonderful. Yeah, and I'm... Edgar Wright also, I interviewed them both. Lovely people. Yeah, I met Simon Pegg once. Um, I was a few years ago now. Um, some friends and I had been to a film convention exhibition in London, and we were wandering around South Bank killing time before our train home back to Stafford. And we were down on South Bank, and we saw all these, this massive film crew behind... Um, uh, behind the theatre on South Bank, and we we're like, oh, I wonder what's going on here. So we hung around for a few minutes, and then we had to leave. We didn't see anything exciting. Um, and as we were leaving, Simon Pegg was coming towards us, um, and he stopped for a few minutes and chatted with us. And yeah, he was an absolutely lovely guy. So wonderful, and and he's you know done so many incredible things, you know. And mm. when I interviewed him, of course, Shaun of the Dead was the first big thing that brought Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright to our attention. But I love that film. I normally only go and see anything once because once I've seen it, I kind of, that's it for me. Um, but this, I kind of managed to see twice after that, after the first viewing. Yeah, I, I love that, that whole trilogy. Oh, wonderful. Very much, yeah, loved it. And what a great charity. I'm very, very honored to be a part of it. Thank you very much for asking me. Oh, thank you for saying yes. That's an absolute pleasure. Um, right, should we crack on then? Let me ask, um, let me start with a question that I, as I've said before, I start every interview with an actor or actress like this. How did you get into this industry? Because it's, it's <laughs> you find that everyone has like a really different story. So how, what, what's, what's, your, what's your story? How did you get into this world? Um, well, I, I mean, I'm not going to go into it because I hate talking about, you know, the dramas in one's life that people these days are very happy to talk about, I'm not. Um, but I'd had a very serious car accident. Mm. Um, I'd been a dancer and I'd done quite a bit of modeling as a very young girl. My sister was a top model in New York um, with Eileen Ford, <laughs> five foot 11 and I'm five foot. I don't know what happened there. Um, and um, so basically, you know, any idea of doing, you know, I had my face, had to have a lot of surgery on my face. I broke all my bones in my body, basically, and spent about two years of my life in hospital. So when I finally came out, um, I went to America to visit my sister and I was at a party and I kind of got, 
spotted by MGM and they flew my parents over and wanted me to sign a, a contract for five years. And my father explained that, you know, if you do that, you can be five years and do nothing. You can be five years and do one film, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I very rarely listened to my parents. I was that sort of child. Um, <laughs> and I, it made a lot of sense to me. And it suddenly dawned on me that I wouldn't be able to dance anymore, but I could talk. Yeah. And so without telling anybody, I just took myself off to every audition for every drama school in London. And I thought, well, whoever takes me first gets me. Mm. Um, and so then I told my parents I'd done it and I got into Weber Douglas, which is now part of Central. Mm. And um, I did my, my training there. And then I came out and did a very small part in Softly Softly. And then I landed four lines because I did actually speak French, which is <laughs> um, as a French au pair girl in a groundbreaking series by John Brain called Man at the Top. Mm -hmm. And um, I was taken out of the four lines. I thought I'd been sacked already. Um, and they said, no, we want you to play the um, young juve lead. So I had two episodes. The second one was written specially for me because they were really happy with the first one. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing that, I actually auditioned for Doctor Who mm -hmm. after they'd shortlisted it to three um, out of the hundreds that had auditioned. And I got it. So it was that kind of climb. You know, I came into acting. I said, everybody always said they knew I was going to be an actress. I was the only one that didn't know that. Mm. <laughs> but once I got to drama school, um, I realized that it was it was my passion and I didn't realize I'd been kind of doing it all my life, you know, voices and always mimicking people and, and coming up with wacky voices and so on. And that had a lot to do as well with the fact that I had they didn't you know, I, I, I don't see very well. I'm not allowed to drive or anything. Mm. Um, and so sound is so important to me. Mm. So there you go, that was it. Yeah. And the rest is history. I've now been doing it for 50 something years. Yeah, well here, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so yeah, you started in Man at the Top um, and then that obviously led to, to the audition on Doctor Who. So did you know that you were auditioning for Doctor Who or was, was there any sort of like secrecy with it back then? Um, I don't remember there was. I mean, you know, I mean, it was, I, I, I know that, um, they would wanted me to audition earlier, but I couldn't because I was working. Um, but apparently Barry Letts decided he had short to listed it to, to three um, and they'd all auditioned and read for it. I hadn't read for it. I had no idea what the character was. I just went when I could. Yeah. And uh, got very lost at the BBC Centre. So I was extremely late. <laughs> yeah. um, and I didn't read for it because I didn't have my glasses and you know well I wasn't prepared to put my glasses on because I've always been so teased about them and um anyway so that I improvised and they gave me an improvisation to do instead and the next day they called me and they said would you like to play Jo Grant well I didn't know a lot about her because we hadn't had much discussion about what the character was or anything so um it was, it was, and also, you know, people don't realize these days that back then, although it was an extremely popular program, it had basically been a children's program. It didn't have this massive, great, you know, it isn't, it was nothing like it is now. And of course I was in all the papers. Yes, the new um, Doctor Who companion and so on and so forth. But, and I'd watched it very early um, with William Hartnell and I'd seen some of Pat Troughton, but then, you know, I spent, a, you know, the rest of the time I was kind of working and I didn't see a lot more. Mm. Um, and it didn't have the same hype that it has now. It was just an incredible role to get. Mm. Um, so very early in my career as well, you know, it was a, an amazing job to get because you, we were doing things that you would never normally done as an actress. You know, we were working with all sorts of new things like uh, CSO, color separation overlay, yeah. which we, you know, they were experimenting with on me. <laughs> um, and, you know, that it was such an extraordinary show to do. And of course, an incredible place to be at the BBC for that length of time. And I was welcomed into all the special effects. I got to know all of those people. I went into editing suites. I learned all about television, really. Whereas before I just kind of done it. 
this was an amazing place to learn. Um, and of course, you know, as time went by, suddenly we got this huge cult following and suddenly something, you know, like fans appeared and it was just extraordinary. And I had to do radio interviews, which I'd never done before. And John Pertwee said to me, you have to learn when you do a radio interview that everybody at home is doing their ironing or their washing or whatever they're doing. You have to stop them doing that. <laughs> So you can't be monosyllabic and say, yes, no. You have to do something that wakes everybody up and makes them go, what? <laughs> um, and working with such amazing actors, directors, uh, technical people, it, it was just, I mean, I learned more in that time than I think I ever learned at drama school. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. You know, it was Definitely. extraordinary. I imagine it's um, one of those places as well. I never thought I'd be a plastic figurine years <laughs> later. Yeah, well, that kind of ties into what I was going to say. Like, no day is is the same on a show like that. Like, one day you'll be filming in a box that's bigger on the inside than it is outside, and then the next day you'll be fighting big, giant things in a... I forget what they're called, in a carnival of monsters with things and stuff, and, yeah, just... Well, you, you're, you're dealing with aliens, and so, therefore, you're... You have to be so real to make those things real. Yeah. Um, you never send anything like this up. You can't for one moment suspend your total belief. And because I couldn't see, they used to take my glasses just before we went for a take. And so for me, it was really easy because I could see anything I wanted to see because I couldn't see the cameras and everything else. So yeah. I was in this wonderful bubble of, of seeing you know, um, in my head, real monsters. Yeah. It was it was an extraordinary thing. And as I say, a great place to learn so much because I do think that if you are in this business, there's no point in just learning your bit. You have to understand how everything works. It's like in theatre, you know, I have to, I, I'm so glad I understand lighting. So I've been able to direct, I, I understand makeup, I understand costume, I understand set design. Um, and I think it's, that's really, you know, when people say, oh, you know, if you say you're an actress and they say, oh, what, in television? Or, and you go, everything. Yeah. Because every part of what you do, you have to know what the producer's job is. You have to know what everybody's job is and you have to understand it and respect it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. It is, because um, it's, it's one of those industries where like everything overlaps, like even though they have their own roads that they go down, every sort of yeah but over. you you nothing happens on its own yeah, yeah it's not just the actors just the writers you know all of that i mean the greater the writer the easier it is for the actor and so on and so forth mm. but i am a great believer that an actor needs to really look at every part of everybody's job whether yeah. you're in the theater whether you're in film or whether you're in television whatever you're doing i think it is you know so important that it's not just about your what you do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. With some sometimes people get a little bit confused and think, well, I just act. Well, no, you kind of need to do everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, and speaking of great actors, um, everyone who's watched the show will know that you starred in Doctor Who alongside the the late great John Pertwee. Um, the, the the more I hear about this guy, he sounds like the most fascinating person ever. Mm -hmm. I interviewed, um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Bonnie Langford a couple of days ago, and she told a story how um, when they were filming the uh, Dimensions in Time Children in Need special, um, she had a scene with John Pertwee where, and in between takes, um, she went over to his car and he just had a load of his book in the boot of his car that he would just sell. He'd just carry stuff around, which I think is... John was a great one for all the uh, extras. You know, he used to say to me, oh, you need to open garages and shops. I said, I didn't know that was part of my job. Um, John was very keen on merchandising and all that. He had, he had a great understanding of that. I didn't. You have to look at where John came from. I mean, John was basically a light entertainer. Mm. Doctor Who, for him, was the first really serious role that he would played. He'd always done comedy and wonderful voices. And I grew up hearing him on the radio in the Navy Lark. I mean, I didn't associate when I met John. I didn't kind of really know who he was. Mm. 
but then of course, as I found out, I remembered as a child listening to him on the radio, even trying to do the voices that he did, you know. Um, and he was a font of knowledge because he, you know, he'd done variety. He'd been in music hall. Um, you know, we became very close friends. And, you know, my boyfriend at the time and I went to Ibiza to, with him and his wife and Sean, who was, you know, like about five or whatever he was then, and Dario, the sister. Um, and, you know, he would water ski, he wanted to do everything. And the other great thing about working with John is that he, I was allowed to do my own stunts, you know. And so the stunt men would teach me how to, you know, uh, jump out of a moving car so that you didn't have to do it in two shots and have me just tuck rolling into the shot. I could actually do the whole thing. Abseiling, you know, it was wonderful to work with somebody who was so keen to do all his own stunts. Um, we worked very closely with Havoc. Um, that was something that, you know, in this day and age, I probably wouldn't be allowed to do. So that was extremely exciting to be able to work back then because you were much freer. And I mean, if I'd fall, I used to, every time I fell over, the director said, oh, don't worry, she'll get up. <laughs> um, so John was very exciting. And also, you know, he had all these amazing theatrical stories. And it, once again, you know, you couldn't have learned any of these things at drama school. I started to, you know, know a lot more about older. I mean, even though I'd grown up with a lot of show business around me as a child, this was extraordinary and and so wonderful as a young actress to have somebody like that plus all the guest actors and Roger Delgado and Nicholas Courtney who were also you know very seasoned actors and from whom I learned so much yeah you know, amazing people I mean I'd been very blessed in my career with the kind of people I grew up but I was just growing up with them this was different this was different. I was actually working and I had found what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. And John was amazing. He never left my side. We did everything together. We used to have lunch together. We'd drive to locations together, do voices together. You know, it was, it was a wonderful show and everybody who ever worked on it had such a great time yeah. because we were a very, very tight group you know, that welcomed and we, we, we were all so close. We socialized outside of the show. We got on so well. And I think that's the sort of bonus because I do think subliminally people watching it can see the connection that we all had. Yeah, definitely. It, it really comes across on screen. Like you can tell that there's, it's, it's, it's not really acting. Like there is that, um, that beauty to it that you can tell there is a real friendship going on there as well. Well, you know, it's like, as an actor, you often have to uh, meet somebody for the very first time. Mm. And you have to have had maybe a long, very close relationship with them. And it, there's something of, that you often see, you know, when you're watching something and you don't believe quite that these two people are married or but you don't quite know why. Yeah. And, and one of the most important things, too, as an actor is to be able to find those little things that just make it feel that you've, you could have been married for 25, 30 years. You know, there's little tiny things that we do when we know somebody so well. And we were so lucky with this because somehow, you know, the chemistry, as Barry Lett said, the one thing when you're casting is that you are hoping that you've got that chemistry. Yeah. You know, so that you, it, because that you, you can act it, but when it's there, it's just a blessing. Yeah. And we just yeah. had it, you know, all of us. I know when I've been casting for, for projects where I've got like a couple or something like that, it's, it's the hardest thing to try and find. And it's not really the kind of thing that you can, well, you can give it like as much direction as possible, but if, if it's just not there, it's not there. Like, well, exactly. And I always find, you know, and I've had to to play, you know, I mean, I've played so many different characters and that, where that chemistry is absolutely vital. Um, and I always think if I'm supposed to be in love with this, per you know, this person's just say, um, I met my partner <laughs> in a play many years ago, and we had to be this couple that had been married for, you know, 15 years. And, and I don't literally just shake shook hands with him and said hello lovely to meet you, you know? um, and the next thing you're having to have this wonderful passionate um, relationship 
Um, and so you think of all those little things, you find all those little tiny, tiny things that people sort of subliminally do when, they, when they've been together for a long time. And I think that's, um, you know, one of the jobs that we have to do. And it's really, really important. So you, you have to kind of get to know and understand and find people's little oddities. Um, and then of course, utilize the characters given things to put it all together. You know, there are so many things you have to put together that are so tiny other than just, you know, finding your character, understanding where they're coming from and what they're doing there and so on and so forth. It's, it's just so important, yeah. you know, just to have that credibility yeah. that these people really do know each other as opposed to have just met. <laughs> of course. And when, when, when you find it, you can really see it on screen now and you can definitely see it with you and John. Um, well, you Great thing with John and I was there to begin with, but I was fortunately given a character in Joe Grant that didn't come in and stay the same. She came in and she grew up. She did, yes. You watched her growing up. Every season, you saw the changes in Joe. Yeah. And that's why when I came back in the Sarah Jane Adventures and Russell T had, you know, he gave her exactly the right background. Yeah. You know, this was who she was. And so you watched her grow again, but you watched it truly, I mean, very fresh out of school, done about a year's training, uh, got into unit because of a uncle or something, done a totally useless training, <laughs> didn't pass her science exams. Um, and you watched her from this very young, naive girl grow and learn from the doctor, right to the point that she married a Nobel Peace Prize winner who yeah. was the closest thing she would ever get to the doctor that she really loved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it was very lucky because usually in these things you don't get that growth. Mm. You know, you go in as one person, you come out as the same person exactly. Yeah. But she definitely didn't. No, not at all. I think it's one of the rare examples as well, especially in the classic series of, of where that happens. Because like me and my girlfriend, we're watching the classic series at the moment and we're up to, we're nearing the end of, uh, we're halfway through Earthshock with Peter Davison at the minute. So we've seen like everything that we can before that. And so many characters come in and leave the same. Yes. And Joe is just so standout amongst everything else. As, as a character that has a real development and that there is well it was, it was it was it was an absolute joy to have that development it really was it was because it gave the character so much more richness for me to to play with and indeed I was growing up yeah of course, of course. <laughs> in terms of um, my my experience and what I was learning um, whereas, you know, some actors go into it and some actresses, I'm going to have to use the two because I get so fed up with this one word <laughs> um, and and go into it. Uh, and they've already had quite a lot of experience prior to it, mm. you know, um, whereas I'd had very little. And so that was another, a, 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 you know, aspect of it as well. It was kind of happening on and off screen kind of thing. Yeah. But John was magnificent. He was you know, he truly um, looked after me. And I was in a very, I say this a lot because of the difficulties that so many people seem to have during the 80s and things. I was never treated as anything like the girl. Yeah. I was in on every meeting, every discussion. There wasn't an area of the BBC that I wasn't welcomed into, yeah. um, you know. But it's kind of funny, just a, a slight silly story. The very first time that Doctor Who went out in the Radio Times, if you look on the radio side of, you know how the Radio and TV Times had TV one side, radio the other. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so funny because you look over to the radio and at exactly the same time as, as my first Doctor Who went out, my father, it said, the last word, J.L. Manning, sports report. <laughs> So, nice. And then when I got into the West End and got my name in lights, my father got an OBE. So we were always kind of <laughs> <Very interesting. laughs> chasing each other. 
Now, of course, um, as, as we've just talked about, you work with John Purby as well, but um, you, you're, you're one of the, um, the few companions that have actually had, or one of the few actresses rather, that have actually had the opportunity to work with multiple doctors. Um, yes. Being Patrick Troughton in, in... Well, starting with the three doctors. Yeah. How, how was it? You know. Tell me about him, because he just sounds absolutely fantastic. Pat Troughton? Yeah. Well, uh, the, the wonderful thing first I'll just say about um, William Hartnell, who, you know, he was the footprint, you know, because we forget, we all have, everybody's always banging on about their favourite doctor. We have to remember, there's only one doctor. Yeah. These are all the regenerations, and every single one of them has brought an extraordinary magic Maybe. and the extra heart to the role, you know? Um, but it was a very interesting thing because I... You, for William Hartnell, he was so ill. Um, and this was the last thing he did. And I found it very touching that the last thing he did was to come back as the doctor yeah. that had given, although he had a great career prior to it, you know, this was the big landmark of his career. Yeah. Um, and he was just brilliant. Um, but when we came to doing The Three Doctors, now, Pat Troughton was basically, I mean, for want of another, you know, few words, he was the Shakespeare trained stage actor. Yeah. You know, um, and not known to me prior to this, um, other than as Doctor Who, I didn't really know a lot about his previous, you know, his work on stage. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but loved him as Doctor Who, absolutely loved him. And, um, he so he was the classically trained one and John was the light entertainer the one that you would think would be the one that would do all the improvising and so on and so forth right mm -hmm. um doing because he did stand up he he did everything you know um and so when we came to it, it was really interesting because Pat liked to play with the script John didn't yeah John wanted every, and so there was 20 minutes watching these two extraordinary actors, these two wonderful men. And he would say, now, you know, well, how can I respond if I don't know what you're going to say? So, you know, there's that moment where, when, when there's slight tension in the room, I get the giggles, you know, it's that dreadful thing. You know? <laughs> um, and you're watching these two extraordinary men finding their place because they'd never put you know, two doctors together that had played the same role. Mm. Um, and it was amazing. But after about 20 minutes, you started to see them balancing. And, you know, because they were like sniffing around each other and, no, I can't do this if you do that. And, rah, rah, rah. and then about 20 minutes, and then you just watched how they both found this wonderful relationship which we can see today and they continue to be great friends at conventions apparently you know years later oh, yeah. um but it was it was a wonderful moment um on audio i mean i've obviously worked with matt smith mm -hmm. who is an amazing young actor i said to him john pert would be really proud of you i mean he's He's such an instinctive, wonderful, physical, quirky actor, you know? Um, and he was so gentle with me because they were quite difficult scenes to play that one where Joe realizes this, this actually is her doctor. Mm. And he said, you know, you just take your time. But he was funny and wacky. Um, he described me once as as mad as a box of frogs. I said, listen, have you worked with yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and then on audio, you know, I've worked with Colin Baker, I've worked with um, Peter Davidson, I've worked with Sylvester McCoy. Mm -hmm. um, who else have I worked with? <laughs> I've um, done the whole run, haven't you? It I, I, really felt like, I was going to say, you name a doctor, basically. Um, and on audio and you know I've now worked with Missy and I've also got a new audio coming out which is Joe and Sir Derek Jacobi's master. Ah right okay. That'll be out fairly shortly so yes I've, I've worked with a lot of doctors and what's so extraordinary both as Joe, Joe Jones and Iris Wildtime. Yeah, yeah. And it's wonderful to see what they bring 
to this extraordinary character. And it, it's fascinating and wonderful. And they're all so good. Yeah. You know, if you say, who's your favorite doctor? I don't have one. I think they've all been and are, because I, I watch, I, I was out of the country during the 80s and 90s. Um, and in America and Australia, you didn't get Doctor Who really, you get the odd episode, you know, or else you really have to go to PBS or whatever, you know. And then I was in the theater for years. And so I just didn't see, so I made it my business to watch as many as I could because I wanted to know and appreciate, you know, all the other wonderful companions. But when it went off for a while, which I think it possibly needed to do for a little while, mm. because it has to keep growing. Yeah. Um, and, when Russell T, who was the perfect person to bring it back, you know, he was inspired along with so many people, you know, Mark Gatiss and you, you name almost anybody who works in Doctor Who and they're doing what they do because Doctor Who inspired them to do it. Yeah, definitely. Children. Um, and he, I, I just cheered after the first episode because I thought Christopher Eccleston was brilliant. I love Billy. I, I just, and I haven't missed one episode since. Yeah. I love it. It's it, it, I, I, like. There's not many shows that have taken a break and then come back uh, with with such a strong team behind it, both behind the camera and on screen. Like I honestly, well, I think if there was anyone else truly, you, you know, working with Sarah Jane. What you find out, and everybody that I work with, not just you know, and with all the big finish and all those things, they are all run. Um, they the, everybody directing. They all grew up inspired by this show. So many of the writers, you know, Rob, Rob Shearman, you know, they grew up with this show, making them think, wow, I want to be a part of something like that. I want to be a writer. I want to be a director. I want to be that, you know? And I think that's the love that goes into Doctor Who. And when that stops, if it was ever run by people who weren't, hadn't grown up with this passion for it, I think it may lose something. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as you said, like I'm, I work in the film and TV industry now as well, and I'm doing exactly what I'm doing because of this show. I yeah, mean, I watched it. I my first Doctor was David Tennant in his first series, and I was like, oh, I want to like I, I never really knew what I wanted to do as a kid. Um, I knew it was something in the arts. I just wasn't sure. Um, but when I saw David Tennant, I was like, oh, I want to act. So I went on. It's it's a show and, that has inspired since its start you know because you're young so you know most people were inspired right at the beginning or you know russell t davis um mark gatiss and 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 moffitt and all it was the john pertwee era yeah yeah um you know so it, it, i don't think it mattered when you watched it no, I mean, I'm not a science fiction fan, but I remember the first time that I watched it with William Hartnell. It was so exciting to see television that was so different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that's but I mean, I'm not a science fiction fan. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I, I know, you know, it's, it's something, but I love this new series. It, it's, I, and I, I have no idea why, because as I say, I'm not a huge science fiction fan. But it, there's just something about the performances and the, you know, watching it now with all the technology that we have is, I find very exciting. Yeah, definitely. You know? It really is. I tell you what I do miss, though. Go on. Um, I'm, I'm, I like cliffhangers. You know when people say they binge watch? I've never binge watched in my life. Perhaps on an aeroplane, you know, I've sat and watched Curb Your Enthusiasm or something like that. But... Um, I don't binge watch. I, if any, like, it's a sin, the new, you know, the Russell T Davis. Mm -hmm. I want to watch it every Friday or Thursday or whenever it's on. Doctor Who, for me, I need to sit on the sofa when it's on and watch it. And then I'll wait. I like to wait, like, if there's a cliffhanger, I want to wait the whole week. Yeah. I, I can't do all this binge watching because I don't want to know that quickly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I want to be able to, and I do miss a little bit having those those wonderful gosh i've got to wait till next week yeah you know yeah. i find that very exciting yeah 
Well, there's, I mean, there's still a little bit of that left with, with the, the, yeah. the two parties and stuff that they do. But Yeah, but, you know, in general, that's the only thing I miss is that I love it when it goes and you think, oh, my God, what's going to happen? And now, of course, you know, people say, oh, well, I'll just watch it and find out now. And I think, no, I don't want to know now. Mm. It's like opening your Christmas presents, you know, before all of them at the same time, as opposed to, you know, one by one. Yeah. You know, I, I like that kind of excitement, but that's just, you know, me. Yeah. Well, <laughs> our own um, preferences with the show and things like that. So, like with the different favorite doctors and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I think I tell you the other wonderful thing about this show, too, when we're talking about inspiration, I think something that has touched me and means more to me than anything else you know when people say what did you get out of this show and they're waiting for me to say oh the wonders of being given these amazing roles straight after it you know with target as the junkie and then the first lesbian play on television you know directed by douglas canfield and uh target where i played the junkie was written um um by bob um oh lovely bob who created K9? Oh, um, oh. Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Bob. 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 I'm sorry, my brain sometimes goes into. Anyway, um, it wasn't any of those things because I went into such different roles. That I don't think it was actually through Doctor Who at all. Um, what really did it for me was the fact that having when I started doing conventions and I was very late doing conventions, you know, they were all doing them in America when I was living in Australia. And um, the thing that really touches my heart and has given me the greatest gift that Doctor Who could ever give me, and I've said this several times now, is the fans that maybe weren't in, you know, didn't go into the business because of it. That's very exciting. And I think it says a lot about a show that has inspired people for what, 50 something years. Mm. It's the fans, you know, mine now go from the age of five to 95. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, is the fact that I listen to their stories and I find that there are so many who went through very traumatic childhoods and Doctor Who took them and protected them while they went through these traumatic times. Yeah. And I get, I get goosebumps just thinking about it because I've now, right around the world, have listened to so many extraordinary lives that Doctor Who actually protected and changed. And so for me, that is the greatest gift is to, to hear, to be able to help, to be able to support and to be able to hug and, and show how much we care for them. Yeah. You know, that, that, that really, I, I, I get goosebumps every time I think about it. And I, I do, I spend a, a lot of my life, you know, helping, looking after and showing as much love as I can. Because what fans also don't realise is without them, there is no show anyway. Yeah. Exactly. They don't realise how important they are. Yeah. We're not that important. They're much more important. Yeah, definitely. But also very touching. Some of the stories I've heard, I, I just, you know, wonderful, wonderful people in this world. Yeah. That, is, that is something I want to ask you, actually, because there's a picture that I, I find that goes around on Facebook quite a lot. And it's, um, it's taken, I don't know what convention it's taken from, but it's, um, it's Peter Davison being asked by a fan, what's the weirdest thing a fan has ever given, given you? And his answer is grandchildren, which is the greatest answer to that question. Um, but what, what is something I always like to find out is like, what's, has there been any particular fan experiences that, that stick in your mind? Well, I, I, I can give you hundreds because I am known to hold up cues. I will not do yeah. lunch. I will not go to the loo. I won't ever have a break because I would rather spend that time with each and every fan. I can't do that sign, lovely to meet you, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I can't do that. Yeah. And everybody knows that I won't do that. <laughs> everybody gets hugged. Yeah. <laughs> and that probably is one of the most touching things. 
um, there was a wonderful young man. I mean, there's so many, I promise you. I can go on and on and on and on because I have spent more times. I have a lot of fans that DM me who have, you know, depression problems, anxiety, um, self-harming. Mm -hmm. And I'm often late at night helping them and talking them through because that's a gift to me to that if I can help them and they feel that I can help them, I feel I'm doing something, in, you know, worthwhile as opposed to just having been in a show. Um, but this one really touches me. There's um, a wonderful young man and he um, is autistic um, and he used to come to conventions with his mother. He's also blind mm -hmm. and um, severely autistic. Um, and his, I got up because I didn't know him. I, but, so I got up to do my usual, <laughs> you don't escape me without a hug. <laughs> Even if you're a complete random stranger, you do not escape my hug. Um, <laughs> and I, got up and I put my arms around him and his mother said, oh, no, 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 he doesn't ever hug. He doesn't like to be touched. Yeah. And his arms went round me. Yeah. And his mother had tears streaming down her face and said, he has never allowed anyone, including me, to hug him. Oh, wow. I said, well, I hope I haven't done something terrible here. Anyway, she was absolutely... And he, then the next time he came, he bought me a mug. And his mother said he had told her what he wanted. He wanted this mug and he wanted, I love Katie's hugs on it. Oh. And I mean, you know, and I, every time I've seen him at a, you know, every time he comes to a convention, the first thing he does, he looks and he looks at me and he goes, hug. <laughs> And, you know, that was a breakthrough. Yeah, definitely. Which I didn't know I was doing. Mm. Um, you know, you also get people who um, say that to have those hugs actually changes their lives. To have that, because perhaps, they, you know, some of them have never had those a hug. And my hugs are pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> They're not little doody doody ones. They come here. <laughs> but also, you know, people who have been very ill and I think it's very important to to follow their health and to help them through it um you know there are a lot of people who suffer from anxiety and depression um and they're all things that I you know without having to go into it they're all things which I understand deeply and therefore you know so they are the most extraordinary people and I, I think truly Doctor Who fans are very different when you go to those big conventions and you see doesn't mean they're less of, you know, or not nice people. But Doctor Who fans, there's this feeling of it being a family. Yeah. Even whether you're, there's something about it, you know, that everybody in it, you know, you see, um, you see any of the, the actors that have been in it and they all give you that feeling that yeah. you're not a fan, you're kind of a friend. Yeah. You're part of this enormous, family i call it the doctor who kiss <laughs> nothing like the nothing like the glasgow kiss boom <laughs> two, two very different things but no that's a really good way of putting it like that's it's some when i was at university i made a documentary about like the, the fandom of doctor who and stuff like that and it's it's one thing that's always stuck with me like how all the different stories that you come across and things like that and th there's always an overlap somewhere between experiences oh. that's like it is a family like yeah there's just I'm sorry I just have to tell you one other one oh two weeks ago mm. I got an email from the staff at a hospice in Belfast mm. sent to my agent my agent sent it straight to me and there was a gentleman in there who obviously he's in a hospice and so time is not long. Mm -hmm. um, and so the staff said they were talking to him, you know, asking him about things that he liked and, you know, was there anything they could do that would bring him happiness? 
And he said, I mean, it just happened to be me. It could have been anyone. But he said, I, I've always loved Katie Manning. I would just love to have her, you know, talk to me. Mm. So within minutes of getting this video, uh, this email, I made a video for him. You know, it's, it, it, that's a huge thing yeah. to be able to do to somebody who, you know, you don't know, but you can actually do that for them. And that, that's, that's so special to me. Yeah. No, I, I, I can appreciate that. That's, that's really touching. I mean, what, what, a, what a job to have been given where you can get out and you can help people. Mm. You know, yeah. it really means a lot to me. Anyway. <laughs> well, I can tell it means a lot to you. And it's really nice to see that. It really is. Um, so I, I know you've got a really busy schedule today. So I've just got two more um, really quick questions. That, um, <laughs> so I have 1,200 pages to prepare because I think we're coming out of lockdown. And so far in these books, 40 voices. The most I've ever done is 26 on one audio. Now I'm up to 40 and I'm beginning vending machines, wardrobes that fly using their doors and, and kill you. Um, a dragon with no teeth and cartwheels because he's got no legs. And I mean, to ordinary people as well, um, I, it, it, endless voices, demented sloths, um, and I, every page I turn, I think, thank you, Paul Mars. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> right, okay, so just two really quick, um, quick because I, um, when I found out we were doing this, I put out in um, a request for questions from fans that want to ask you stuff in some, yeah. on Reddit and on in some of the Facebook groups. So um, I'll just pick two of the best ones um, really quickly. So this is from... Um, Dr. Vesuvius on Reddit, and they have asked, do you prefer playing Joe or Iris? Is there a preference for you or, because they like... Would, I'm gonna answer that by saying, I love playing them both together. Exactly. Um, which was my suggestion. And of course, Paul Mars wrote the wonderful Find and Replace. Mm. Um, I, I look, I'm an actress. I'm going to enjoy, you know, I don't just, I mean, also, People don't realise it, but in Torchwood, before I did um, The Green Life as Joe Jones, mm. um, with the wonderful Stuart Bevan playing Boss, which I thought was divine irony, um, I also played a character called Mother Nothing, who was a giant cockroach woman who ate her entire planet, including her own children. Mm. Mind you, I've looked at mine some, no. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you... I have played lots of, I mean, you know, in Dracula, I mean, I played a nun and about, I played so many characters in my life. And then in the play I wrote, you know, I, I did 26 characters. Um, I love playing all kinds of different characters, but Joe and Iris, well, they kind of have both my hearts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they really do have both my hearts. Nice. Yeah, perfect. Um, and finally, um, someone called Sun underscore Lemo has asked, um, was it challenging to return to, to Joe after such a long gap between, um, between the series and when you picked it back up again? Oh, are you kidding? Um, you know, I had visions of all these, you know, new watches of, you know, of, of obviously who and therefore the wonderful Sarah Jane adventures. And I, I was very close to Liz, you know, we, she'd been lovely to me when I first started doing conventions and I had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and she was, you know, and we'd become very, and we'd also shared John. And of course she came into her absolute element when she joined, um, uh, when she she went with um, is it what's wrong with my brain today? I have no idea. When she went with the doctor after John, <laughs> I mean, how bad is that? How can I forget this name? But you know how that really was the perfect partnership as John and I were. So we had a lot that we talked about because it was very difficult for her stepping into that situation um and so with tom you know she really 
found her feet. But um, anyway, so she was amazing because I said to her, there's all these people, they're all very young. And suddenly in comes this mad old granny, this eco granny, um, you know, who and any of the older ones, you know, they're going to be going, my God, look at this woman, you know, a 500 pound elephant slept on her face because people expect you to say, you know how people are always say, oh, you haven't changed. Well, get a grip. Yes, we have unless you've had the wind tunnel surgery. Um, you know, I'm 74, for goodness sake. Um, <laughs> I'm 75 this year. <laughs> but um, so there was that feeling of like, how would people react to, you know, her coming in and actually she's still really cool. Mm. But are grannies cool? I don't know, you know. Um, <laughs> And, but the backstory was so beautifully written. It was such a, a gift. Uh, and then I had the best grandson in the world, didn't I? Hello. Uh, <laughs> in fin and we got on really well. We liked the same music, would you believe? Um, but the whole of, they were so welcoming to me. And Liz was so, she said to me, you know, how do you think I felt? I said, you were younger. <laughs> I said, I've come back after all this time, just old. Um, and, uh, you know, the kids, well, they weren't kids, I discovered. I thought they were much younger than they were. Um, <laughs> and everybody was so lovely. But it, I was petrified because also I had to play Joe so that you, she was the same person as I am now kind of thing. But you have to, in your readying of this part, you have to think, what has her life that she's lived with all these children and grandchildren and, you know, chaining herself to Robert Mugabe and going down the Yancey and teach, you know, doing uh, saving this planet with her Nobel Peace Prize winning and dropping children at the bottom of mountains. And you, I had to find, <laughs> sounds a bit terrible, doesn't it? But that's what she did. What mountain is this? I oh, will name them after that. Um, that I had to find out how she could be who she was. So how had the life that she'd lived in that interim, how had she changed? And yet she still was the same person. Yeah. So that was a very interesting challenge um, to find how she, you know, because we do change, we're not the same. Yeah. And yet we are mm. because life, that you live makes you make changes along the way. Yeah, definitely. So it was the most frightening. I was absolutely petrified. I don't mind telling you, but that wonderful line, and I'll tell you, this is really true. When I walked into the TARDIS, I've seen a lot of TARDISes now, or TARDI or whatever they want to call it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I visited a few as well, as you've seen in photographs, me with certain later time lords um, who immediately wanted to do the John Pertwee shot. <laughs> anyway, um, when I looked up and I said, it still smells the same. And do you know what? It does. Yeah. It really does. I mean, when I went to, there with Peter Capaldi, I said, this is true. Russell T. Davis absolutely nailed that line because this TARDIS, even though it's different to the other TARDIS, right? It does, it smell, it, and what that smell, you know how smell is, so brings back memories. Um, and and that, that, that just stays with me to this day. I don't think I can ever walk into it, any TARDIS that they come up with that won't, smell the same and have give you that same feeling in your heart mm. you know it's 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 quite extraordinary yeah i can imagine <laughs> that's mad lovely uh, right i know you've got a really busy day today so um i think we'll call oh, well, i've got another very quick zoom to do on a promise and i've got the books to prepare mm -hmm. Thank you so much for letting, you know, inviting me. Um, and anytime I can ever help 
with this really good charity, um, I'd be more than happy to do so. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking so, the time as well to, to come and Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. I, I have to confess, you know I can't see you, don't you? Yes. <laughs> I, I just thought I'd share that with you. And I've been dying to do this. Hello. <laughs> I sit there and I'm talking away and, and people don't. John Pertry used to find it so funny because he said, she's no idea who she's talking to, but she'll talk to you anyway. <laughs> right, okay. thank you so much for taking the time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure, darling. And thank you for everything. And goodbye to all the people that on your Facebook. Yes. Thank and, you for watching. I, Really hope you've had a uh, as much fun as I have doing this interview as what I've had a lovely time. Otherwise, I would have said, "Oh, darlings, I've got to go now, haven't I?" <laughs> <laughs> but you were so lovely. I always allow myself extra time, mm. just in case I'm talking to somebody who's really lovely and really interesting, um, and I'm really comfortable with. And you are. Oh, thank you so much. So I didn't suddenly go, "Oh, sweetie, got to go now." <laughs> Lovely. Right. Well, I'll let you go anyway, because I know you won't be. Thank you, darling. Yes. Cup of tea and then on to the next. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, everyone. Um, go and check out Medi Cinema if you haven't already. Um, they do some absolutely amazing work. I will be back soon. Not quite sure when. I'm trying to figure out dates for uh, the next series of interviews that I've got lined up. But I will be back on your computer. And you and they will all be there with you. Yes, I hope so. I hope you will. Um, I'll be back very soon with um, some more interviews coming your way. But until then, Katie, thank you so much once again. It's been thank a you and thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.